Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here. I, last time I think I was here, Kathy Griffin was yelling at me backstage, um, which is what she does today on text. Um, let me take off these, well, no, I'll leave them on for now. Um, so I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad to be back at South by Southwest. I don't see any of you, but it's good to see you all. Um, and it's really nice. I've had some amazing interviews here, and uh, it's just been a big part of my career coming here. I've always loved it, had a great time. Whether uh, I was going to bring Scott Galloway, but uh, he, I don't know what he's doing, drinking uh, Zacapa in Tulum, probably. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but I am thrilled to be doing this interview. Um, I've known, Ke I was just looking at pictures. I, I did a profile of Kevin Systrom 10 years ago uh, for Vanity Fair, and we were talking about it, but I've known him longer than that. Um, I am known for being tough on, on tech people in Silicon Valley. I actually like Kevin. That's not going to prevent me from giving him a hard time here, but um, he's really one of the kind of entrepreneur I love to interview who's creative, who's decent, who uh, doesn't feel the need to call constant attention to himself, doesn't think he's Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, isn't pontificating on the banking crisis for which he has no knowledge. Uh, he will talk about his own experience in a second. Um, but, and also the vaccine crisis or Ukraine or whatever, all these people who have no, shouldn't be talking. Um, in any case, what he, when he does talk, it's really interesting about product. And he's, Instagram was one, it has been one of the greatest products. Um, as I tell him, I think he sold it for far too little to Facebook, but nonetheless, he's, he's come back with a new product called Artifact, and I really like it, and I want to talk about entrepreneurism and where it's going. Uh, without further ado, Kevin Systrom. Hello. Thank you. Oh, have a seat. Um, so we, on my way, uh, while we were walking here, I did an interview with Mark Benioff recently, which he had read about on, on Artifact, and he said, I thought you liked Mark Benioff, and I do. We actually do like each other. It was a little spicy. So let's do that here. Um, so, and I really like Sarah, him. the most intimidating 10 seconds of anyone's life is before you walk on stage with Kara. Yes, thank you. Obviously. Okay. Good, but I'm small but mighty. Anyway, let's not get into this. We have, um, we're gonna hit a lot of topics today. Um, we, we're gonna talk about Artifact, the AI-powered newsreader you recently launched with your co-founder of Instagram, Mark Mike Krieger. Um, but we've gotta start out with Silicon Valley Bank. It's really hard. And you told the collapse because of its outsized impact on the industry. Talk about your exposure. This is that you do self-funded, uh, artifacts, but the company, your, all your investments have exposure at SVB? Yeah, uh, exposure. What's 1% higher than 99%? 100. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I was, you know, we work remotely. We're seven people, seven whopping people at Artifact right now. Um, and I got a call from Mike, which I rarely get calls from Mike. And he goes, are you following this SVB thing? And I said, no, I like, what's happening? And he's like, Move it all, sell it all. And I, I wow. Mike is a very mild mannered, calm guy, very happy. And when Mike sounds the alarm, I know something's up. So obviously, uh, the next hour of my life was figuring out if everyone was overreacting, they probably were. And at the same time, the fact that everyone was overreacting meant that there was actually a problem, it was self fulfilling prophecy. Um, so yeah, uh, 100% of what we have at Artifact is now locked up in this process, but that's okay because I, we are seven people. Um, the good news is the co-founders of this company happen to have enough personal liquidity that we can figure out how to loan the company money for the time being. We can be uh, you know, an ATM, mm -hmm. hopefully, um, because we're not burning a lot. But there are other companies with exactly the same percentage locked up who need not only to meet payroll, but they have all these bills, and people don't just have this money lying around. You can't, you can't just dish it out. Yes, you put it in a bank. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, which one, it turns out. Um, I myself have gold in my mattress, but go ahead. Yeah, it's, it kind of doesn't, it's not comfortable to sleep no. on gold, though. Um, a hard bed. So we're trying to figure it out, but uh, I think we're in a much better place than most companies, but it's still, you question, um, you know, all the bullshit that's going to get thrown at you starting a company, this is last on the list of your expectations. Um, right. So what do you think the impact is going to be? You talk, one of the things that I like that you're talking about is you're focusing on not the depositors, but the companies that are going to be affected here, that these are the depositors. Some of them have loans, also have loans there. Some of them have personal loans. Right. Some of them have their own money. 
locked up in this. Did you use Silicon Valley Bank for Instagram at the time or not? I'll, to be honest, I don't even remember who we used. Right. I think the company existed for like six months before we sold it. So yeah. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think we, I think we used like Bank of America or something. Um, but the, it, the times were different back then. Right. So why did you use them this time? It's a, very, it's a bank that is, that is attuned to startup needs. Why did you say, oh, we're going to use this one? I don't think it was a conscious decision so much as, I mean, this is one of the problems with banks. It shouldn't be a conscious decision. You should just be able to look around and go, oh, I guess that's where we'll put stuff. But as you find out in Silicon Valley, whether it's wealth managers or accountants or lawyers, there's this herd mentality and no one actually asks each other why they use whatever service they use. If you're an entrepreneur, one of my lessons is like, ask why, do some due diligence. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think that's important because you never really know what you're getting into, but there's a lot of like, oh, so-and-so company uses X, Y, or Z, we should use them. And that creates problems in the long run. Right, and that's the, the concentration's a big issue. 100%. 50% of startups. Yeah. So as a founder and investor, you think the demise reveals structural issues in Silicon Valley besides herd mentality, which you and I have talked about, but VC power and the concentration? I mean, I'm... I'm not. You you said before not to mm -hmm. not to go around talking about things and waxing. I'm not poetic, asking you if what Janet Yellen should do. Waxing poetic on on. Uh, I, I, I get. I'm not asking. Yeah. That, that's up to Jason Calacanis to decide what Janet Yellen should do, um, because he's the world's expert on that. He I just, have no. I have no idea what should happen. All I know is that uh, there is real. There's real potential for contagion, right. and it does make sense that the government and other regulating bodies should step in and figure out how to make this not a contagious event, because first republic apparently is fine, but they're fine until they're not fine. By the way, every bank, the, the one way you know it's not going well is when you get an email from them saying everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. At that point, you sell. And, yeah. um, and the number of emails I've been getting inbound in the last few days, but maybe it is fine. So uh, we'll find out. I, everyone's doing all this work this weekend to prepare. Like, what's the game theory Monday morning when all the shit hits the fan? Because everything could be totally fine or we can see everything collapse very, very quickly. And when I say everything, likely not everything, but right. um, it, can be, it can be a lot scarier than I think people think. This is a new experience for Silicon Valley. I mean, they sort of didn't pay attention for the last bailout, the one before that, and everything else that much, except how it affected the 2008. I, I, in the 2008. I mean, like there was the classic good times are over. What was the email? Was that Ron Conway who sent it or Sequoia? Oh, it was like RIP good times. Yeah, they had a graveyard. Yeah, but I mean, often I think, you know, uh, venture capitalists in these situations use this as a really nice opportunity to cut costs and bring things back to reality right. and bring prices down. And um, so we'll see. Um, but I, I'm not looking forward to tomorrow morning. I'm definitely headed home tonight. I'm going to be at my desk. At so what's your open. plan? What's the what is the plan? Uh, well, the good news is FDIC 250K, that covers in a five person company. This is wholly uninteresting, but the, it covers enough for at least a few months. Um, and I think we'll be okay just getting through that. There is no plan other than to watch the cards fall. You can't, you can't pre-plan other than asking yourself what crazy shit's about to happen. And right, how am but I you gonna... have done that. You showed me something on your phone, like that you had researched. What yeah, you... well, I got an email. So I invested, like I'm, I'm fairly quantitative in, in my life, obviously through Artifact and stuff. And I work with some quantitative investors and they sent basically a, a historical account of every time banks have failed over the last 20 years, how much you get back. And unfortunately, there's not one number. There are lots of numbers, and there's a range, and it goes from 4% all the way up to losing 20 or 35% of your, your actual deposits. But what no one actually, not no one, people aren't paying attention to is it's like, Getting back 95% of your money, I think would be fine. It's when do you get 95% of your money back? Mm -hmm. It's the liquidity that causes all the problems. It's not the amount, right. generally speaking. Right. Um, a lot of these companies will lose more than 5% of their value in a given day, depending on the market, theoretically. But if you don't get that 95% back in enough time to pay your employees, pay your bills, I mean, there are knock-on effects. We pay AWS, we pay Slack, we pay, and all those companies have creditors. So there's this knock-on effect. Um, so, you know, I, everyone likes to say this is in one industry, it's very small, it's those Silicon Valley folks, but this stuff cascades pretty quickly if you let it get out of control. And I'm, I guess I'm an optimist and I, I, I think we've been through this enough times that someone will step in, but Politically, I think it's fairly difficult to now, given given the bailouts of and the, the past speed, and the speed at which people moved. You know, in terms of people pulling out, very that caught the the run is was the problem. Yeah, some VCs 
in particular because of all these companies being online and having the ability to just wire. I mean, SVB gave free wires. They just redid their website. It used to be a really terrible website where it like took a long time to. Yeah, it's fast. Now, like you log on and it's fast to send a wire. So part of that is that they made it so efficient to get money out uh, that it caused a problem. So I, I guess I just was like one step like I, I, I put in the wire and I just watched it sitting in processing for three hours. Yeah, just stared at it. Yeah. Yeah, didn't work. It's painful. It's painful. So when you think about this, this has been a tough year for tech and you're starting a company. I want to get into Artifact in a second, but what is the long-term fallout? Because it's not just this, it's the layoffs, obviously the whole uh, FTX thing, which is separate, possible fraud, alleged fraud. I think it's fraud. Um, uh, uh, they kept the money in a drawer, et cetera, those kind of things. Um, is this something that we brushed over in the collective memory, uh, or do you think it has any long-term effects in the brand of tech? Because now everyone's like, oh, maybe they're not so smart. I thought that the whole time, but go ahead. <laughs> not you. Who's they? Not you. Can we be specific? Not you, but honestly, um, Kevin, it's a low bar, but go ahead. <laughs> My sense. Yeah. is that whenever there are good times, you should be really concerned in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Whenever companies that you know are dumb ideas are raising many tens of millions of dollars, uh, when people are throwing excessive parties, when I guess I'm just old enough. Like I basically, I was in, let's see, so uh, 2008, I would have just been coming out of college, but 2000, I would have been coming out of high school. So I saw both crises from afar. Mm -hmm. And the patterns just repeat over and over and over again. But what you realize is no one gives a shit. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you're making money on the way up, it's like musical chairs. If you can just like find a seat before everything comes crashing down, you make a lot of money and you go away and you're happy. But it turns out there are a lot of people without seats at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's crushing to, to the Bay Area generally that is already dealing with enormous wealth disparity. And it, my point is, it was very clear that the writing was on the wall, that bad things were going to happen. And I don't know. Like, I think the SVB thing is like 5 or 4% of the bad stuff to come. So uh, we'll see. To come. Yeah. That has happened because we've had the layoffs. We've had XTX. We've had this thing, this social media misinformation. Oh, the insurrection that had a little bit, it has a social media flavor to it. Um, what, what's to come from your perspective? That's the part that no one knows, but so I've talked about this fairly publicly. Um, I have a lot of respect for Ray Dalio uh, and Bridgewater. They study economic crises from the past. And when I left Instagram, I was interested in finance, so I bought his book on debt crisis and I read it's through it. It's a very thick book. Very thick He's, book. He writes big books so that you can throw them on a, a small dog and kill them. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but if you read the one on debt crises before you throw it on the dog, um, Every single, one, every single crisis is precipitated by rising rates, specifically very quick rising rates. Mm -hmm. And this is no different. It's the exact same pattern over and over and over again. And typically, typically you don't see a recovery in a year. You see, you see multi-year issues, and there are these cascading effects, just like I said. You have a liquidity in a bank, and it leads to this, and that company can't pay that company, and things fall out from that, lots of jobs, livelihoods. Um, so none of this, I think, is surprising as a pattern, but the specifics, obviously, of how they come out are surprising, mm -hmm. the specific, specifics of it. Did I ever imagine you could put money into a bank as a startup in a savings account mm -hmm. and lose it? And by the way, like, I don't know enough about the SVB internals to know this, but like, it doesn't seem like they were betting on highly speculative bets. No, no, bets. it's not. It wasn't that. It was treasuries. And then, and so like, when's the last time you got in trouble for buying treasuries? That's crazy. This week. Exactly. <laughs> so, well, now, now look, a lot of people would say you should have seen it coming. This was the free money era and then it was over. So one might have even RIP even good Kara times. Swisher understood this, yeah. right? Like, oh, the interest rates are going to go up. I am both jealous of younger entrepreneurs because they seem to I, they can work harder, longer hours. They don't have kids. They but none of them have seen like I mentioned to someone years. I, I mentioned to someone the other day, um, I, I asked them if they knew what dig was. They're like, what? Because I was explaining Artifact, which we should talk Kevin. about at some point. We were just talking. Everyone thinks he's Kevin. No, Rose not everyone. I was on the street here in South by Southwest, and someone goes, Kevin Rose. Right. Yeah. Wrong Kevin. Right. Um, I was like, I need to do more interviews. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I love Kevin Rose, by the way. So um, 
dig founder because yeah but i was explaining all the companies that had tried to do news and information and mm -hmm. links before artifact and i was like so delicious we're back at delicious delicious what's delicious was before the, um actually yeah, how no. many people in the audience know what delicious was or is okay good it was great right yeah, yeah it was um dig etc and it's just like this new generation of entrepreneurs it's fascinating because i didn't realize so much of the social web just hasn't been written down. There, there are very few books that talk about the overarching narrative of social in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. People have forgotten what some of these companies did and, or were. I mean, it's funny that Instacart worked mm -hmm. and there were plenty of Instacart versions before they that. certainly were. But you talk to entrepreneurs and they haven't seen the patterns. Mm -hmm. So what, what I at least lack in some of the benefits of being 27 when I, when I founded Instagram, I, I do believe that the second time around, some of the experience at least helps you spot the craziness before it comes. Before it comes. Well, talk about that. What do you, you know, oddly enough, I was interviewing Jamie Lee Curtis the other day. She probably is going to win the Oscar. She came, when I met her in the green room, I said, uh, she's entrepreneurial. She made a diaper that has a what, you know this, that has a wipe and a bag in it. Really it's nice. Nice. It's nice. We're parents. We understand this. Um, and then she said, you know, I invented Instagram. And I said, ah, really? And She's the Al Gore of Instagram. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But indeed, she showed me a blog spot where she had gotten 30 photographers together, and it was an Instagram-like experience. She didn't have the filters, yeah. and it was a, a year and a half before yours. Okay. And so I said, you... Is she was, coming for equity? No, no, no. She's... <laughs> she's she deserves it, honestly. She, she, she deserves it for a long and fantastic career, but she called it iPhony. It okay. was right when the iPhone came yeah. out, she, as, as you recognize. I think Instagram rings a little bit better. No, I understand. <laughs> okay, all right, nonetheless. But, but think about the image of tech shifted from 2010, and I want to walk you to how you got to Artifacts. When you uh, founded Instagram to now, post-pandemic, and Facebook files, and et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, is there a question? Yes, there is. What is the, how has the image of text changed? You just were reflecting on, you were sort of this young yeah. person who didn't know much. How do you think it shifted? Because it was a much headier era in a positive, optimistic note. I mean, the second time around, obviously being a, a, a second time entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you feel like the, the bar is much higher, not in terms of like, will your company work, but you can't make the dumb mistakes you made before. You can't just ignore things. You have to think about moderation. You have to think about the impact on the audience. And it's not to say that we shouldn't have when we were starting Instagram, but we were four kids in a tiny you know, room with no air conditioning, and we didn't know if this thing was gonna work or not, so why would we think about maybe if we scale to a billion people, what will the effects be? This time around, it feels like every single company that gets started, the expectation is, have you thought through the implications of your company? Exactly, and I think that's a good thing. I think the, like, the era of tech just being able to kind of do whatever it wants is long gone, hopefully because it's important that people think through the implications of what their company will do before it gets there. Though, I don't know, I, the good times have led to an enormous amount of excess, whether it's in Web3 or crypto. I, I actually believe in a lot of the underpinnings of Web3 and crypto, mm -hmm. but there's just like a lot of hype and hot air that led to a lot of people losing money and a lot of people buying into the promise that everything was gonna go well. And I saw a lot of people getting into these companies taking advantage of that hot air and, and, and explicitly manipulating the consumer to buy into their vision of whatever animated thing that they were selling. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I think that's why tech gets a bad rap. You were talking about tech guy, mm -hmm. not tech people before, and I was thinking how deeply I care about not being associated with the tech bro image. And I, I realized that being a, literally a tech bro. Yeah. Um, but like how annoying is it to live you know, and, and work in, in an industry where like tech bro is a pejorative term. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of sucks. Yeah, which <laughs> because, we use instead, asshole? What? <laughs> no, no, it's... <laughs> it is really comes but down Kara, to that. No, I'm teasing. They, we all deserve it. Because we walk into these industries and we act like we're gonna reinvent them and, and serve, there's this amazing joke uh, on Silicon Valley, which I couldn't watch because it felt too real. Um, <laughs> Seriously. You no, know, I was an advisor to them, but go ahead. I'm sure, like, That's why it was real. No, it, it hurt too much. I couldn't yeah. watch it. It was like therapy played back at you. Um, sorry, now I'm forgetting the joke you I was were gonna watching. You couldn't watch. Um, no, there was a, a joke there, there was a joke on Silicon Valley. Oh yeah, that was it. There was a, you know, the, the, the company comes out and they're like, because if we can make files smaller, we can make cancer smaller. Right. Like, <laughs> 
It's like, it's one of the best jokes of all time. <laughs> And when you were like, when you said, you know, you can just pontificate on, on subjects you don't have an expertise in, like that's, that is what is wrong with tech bro culture. And I don't know, I probably fall prey to this. I mean, we did RT Live during COVID and, and I deeply wanted to take artificial intelligence and math and try to provide a good service. And at the same time, I can see where all these epidemiologists in the world are like, wait, I've been paid and I studied for 30 years to do that. And just because you can tweet, you can get attention for your website. Meanwhile, my thing's over here and no one's paying attention. Right. There are real implications of you that. You see, you were approaching it a different way. You didn't I tried annoy to. Me. You did not annoy me. The others did. Thank you. Um, and it was because you were trying to get information out there in a way that was helpful to a lot more people and put a, shine a light on those things. Trying to. Of other people's like, Let's talk about that. Before we get to that, 10 years, 11 years since you sold, how do you feel about that today? We, you and I have gone over the situation at Facebook and that experience. You did not stay like Brian and jo Brian uh, uh, Acton and uh, Jan Coombe, who were a little louder on their way out about what happened. Um, do you feel good about selling and good about leaving? It's hard to say you feel, I, there's this terrible Mark Cuban quote where he was like, was it okay to sell your company? He said something about flying here on a G5. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's hard to feel bad if you have access to these things. Or he said it in a more tech bro -y way. Yeah. No one fucking feels bad he for me, He had a sh much shittier company, but go like, ahead. No, like, no one feels bad for me. I think we did okay. We did great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the thing, I, so maybe this is rationalization. It probably, by the way, the other Silicon Valley joke, did you see the one where he walks into the doctor and he's like, hey, I'm really stressed, and um, I, I don't know if I should sell my company. And the doctor was like, oh, yeah, we had a guy like you walk in last week. Uh, yeah, he, like, killed himself because, you know, or he shot himself because he didn't know whether he was going to sell his company or not. And the doctor was like, I can't remember if he sold his company or not. <laughs> and this is why I can't watch this stuff. Like, um, it's actually kind of dark now that I say it out loud. Um, I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> I was going to stage an intervention. No, I'm fine. Um, I thought I might have to hug you. It's actually just like not funny to make fun of mental health issues no, now that is. I think about it. But, um, uh, but the reason why I mention this is uh, uh, I think the worst part of the sale was just like trying to both accomplish something great with the company mm -hmm. and also merge it into a company that didn't quite know how to look at you. Were you a competitor? Were we excited to own you? Like, it's like a roommate who moves in and you're like, oh, like this person's really cool, but also their stuff's everywhere. Right. That's kind of what it felt like for eight years. And but, <laughs> Bad roommate. Yeah, it's like, are there any good roommates? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's the reason why like, people shouldn't have roommates. But I, like, gr it was challenging, but we did great things. So I don't know. Can I look back on the Instagram experience with anything but awe? No, come on. It's, it's amazing. There are over 2 billion people that use it. Um, has it done... You have done that yourself. You, you know I was of the feeling that you sold too soon. And for yeah, little. I heard. I was backstage. Yeah, yeah. I've said it many times. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, because I felt that you really had something special and that you had the capabilities of doing it without their help. Yeah. Um, although they don't think that, but that's whatever, they're wrong. Um, and you're creative and Thank they're you. not um, for the most part. Um, uh, well, they're not, it's just they're shoplifters. But okay, so, um, but. <laughs> Actually really plagiarists, I, I could go on, um, but I won't. Uh, but how do you, do you, do you, when you think back of their time machine, you go back, and you had a little of the knowledge of what was going to happen. What would you have done with it had you not sold? I just don't like playing the counterfactual because right. I don't know. Like, I, I, let's talk about others like Foursquare or Path where they yeah. decide they probably had Path. term sheets and they were, Path. and they said no. And then where are these companies now? Yeah. Um, so well, I don't Facebook know. Facebook didn't sell. Lots of companies didn't sure, sell. Sure. Yeah. But there are plenty of companies yeah. that none of you remember because they didn't sell or they didn't become part of, you know, a rocket ship. I think there were a lot of benefits to being part of Facebook and we, we attached ourselves to an already very large company and were able to grow. And as much as we had conflict, we would probably have had more conflict if we were independent, I don't know. Um, but honestly, as an entrepreneur, let me answer personally for a second. Okay. It's awesome to press the reset button and get to start something new. Yeah. I, I've said this before, so I feel like I'm re-answering the same thing, which is just, so many entrepreneurs get caught up in their public companies and they can't leave. They can't do something new. Like I always felt, even a couple of years into being at Facebook, 
like you want to build new things. You right. want to, and you try to within Instagram and you launch stories and you do video and you do IGTV and you do all these things. And it's like, it's not the same as yep. pressing reset, new brand, new team, new things. So uh, there's an upside. No, and I get it. I... Now to be fair, how much did Elon and company sell PayPal for? Uh, I don't remember. It was very little. It was just like basically a billion dollars, dollars right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's worth a lot now. Yeah. Um, the chapters, I'm 39. I'm still, I, I talk sometimes like I'm older, but like I've got lots of room to go. I'm still excited about building things and that's why we're back in it. You can do it much older too. I'm much older than yeah, you. Yeah, totally. And so it, my point is, no, I get it. I, the book's I, not over. I so. literally have left every job possible in order to reset. And in one, one of them, I went and someone said, this is great, everything's working. Why are you doing it? And I said, I just don't want to talk to you anymore. And... <laughs> And I meant it. I was like, I'm tired of talking to you. I'm going to go do something else, and I'm tired of you telling me things, and I don't want to speak to you anymore. And that was it. That was the reason I wanted to press. That's my version of reset, is get away from me. Um, but, but when you think about, I, I'm going to finish this, because I want to know how, what you did then and how you got to Artifact, because you've done a, it was a long time. It was quite a bit of time. Um, when, you, when you think about it, this teen time spent the, and everything else, what what would you might have done differently? Would you have anticipated the impact um, of Instagram on especially young people in terms of all these problems you didn't think about? And I get why you wouldn't imagine this would happen. Like nobody knew what the internet was going to be because it does get into the AI issue now. Well, I'd say for the last four years of being at Instagram, I spent an enormous amount of time on mental health, kindness. Like we did... We did all these programs, we built everything into the app so that if you were searching on a specific topic where you could detect and then intervene and whether it was you know, pop-up uh, uh, information about mental health or mental health resources like the suicide hotline. In fact, we were sending so many people to these services that we were getting inbounds saying, hey, like, can you help fund us because we're actually being overwhelmed with inbounds of people accessing mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. That is both exciting because we're connecting people and both terrifying as an entrepreneur because you're like, well, it's on our product. They are in fact finding these people, like so many people have issues, how do you help them? Um, I'm not saying we did enough or acted quickly enough, but we certainly tried. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a legacy, when I look at Instagram, uh, it, having a daughter myself now, she's five years old, I think a lot about like if she were to grow up in an era of social media, how would I let her engage with it? Yeah. What would I have done differently? She's about to go to school? Are you sending She's about school? to go to school. Right. So um, I think a lot about these things, but they're almost intractable problems at the scale of two billion people. Like, what do you do? I, my biggest regret, I think, at Instagram is how commercial it got. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, what I mean is most of the power on Instagram, and I mean this to full respect to all the creators in the room or, or influencers, it's just, it focused the energy on people living apparently amazing lives with no bounds, um, doing the fanciest things, looking the best, wearing the fanciest clothes. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I was with someone last evening and they were like, yeah, I moved out to the Bay Area and I see all my friends on New York have, living their best lives and I'm so jealous. And I'm like, come on, you know they're not living their best lives, but of course they're putting the best images on Instagram. Yeah. That dynamic is terrifying as an entrepreneur to who created the thing because um, you want people to know that life is really hard and whatever people post on Instagram is not necessarily, it's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. But um, how do you fight that as an entrepreneur? And what's and good that's though- not particularly good products, your shitty life. No, kind of I, I would, I don't know. Isn't Be Real kind of that? Not that shitty. No, oh, but it's like, Stop performing. Yes. Like, just show us what you're actually doing. Yeah. That's brilliant. I mean, Snapchat, Snapchat came out of the pressure of everyone feeling like they had to have a perfect grid. Right. And now you could just send things to your friends and they would go away and, and there was less pressure. So I... Yeah. Well, that's why we have Twitter and it's run by the person it is. We have that service that's now. That's a different kind of um, yeah, ephemerality. Yeah, no, I'm teasing you. I, I, I'm teasing you. But I mean, I think that it's a difficult, difficult thing. One of the things I was, when it was, when people were being very performative, which you noticed right away, um, I, I got fixated on straight couples when they get married. Mm. When, they, when they, after they get married and they turn around, they always put their hands up together like this. Like, put your hand up with me. You wanna... Like this. Yay, we did it. That kind of thing. Yeah. Which is always I'm excited like, for that screenshot. Later. I know, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, it was this sort of, yay, we, we accomplished this. We uh -huh. managed to yeah, marry yeah. ourselves. 
And That's right. If I had a bouquet in this yes, hand. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, we did it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, it's not a high five moment to me. Uh, but um, lesbians do it totally differently. Um, uh, we, so when I see that, I'm always, you know, someone's like, a friend of mine was like, oh, they're really happy, another happy couple. I was like, they're totally getting divorced. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> like in seven years, it's over. So it was, it was kind of like a, this performativeness had a mental effect yes. on a lot of my friends. It's, but that's, I think, is there any way to fix it? Because I want to get into what you're doing now. Is there any way to make it healthy? Really, give it humanity. I'm hoping that discussions like this, more open discussions about mental wellness, um, that life isn't always so easy, even for people at the top mm -hmm. of their game, whether it's like the best marriage you think or the best company. Uh, life is this giant struggle and like that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people talk enough about that. And you know, I'm not involved in, in what Instagram is doing now, but I hope that there's still a large team because we had one at the time that spends all of their effort communicating that and building products to be more real and st that's a pun, I guess. Um, but like, being more uh, um, clear about what your life is rather than this refined version of it. But I don't know, it's like I study game theory, theory a lot. It's this race to the bottom of like who can be the most perfect. Right, right. And, uh, was TikTok different? It's not a game that, that I like playing anymore. It's entertainment. Professionally or personally. Right, but it's entertainment in a lot of ways. TikTok went the entertainment route, which is more like dancing and singing. It's got dark sides, no question. And, there is that Chinese ownership issue um, that people seem concerned about, including yeah. myself. Um, do you, do you, is there a way to do it at all? You think they're it, it, just talking about it and be, being a more round, it, it, to me it's like a casino, it's never not gonna be that. I'm not gonna found this company, but I believe there should be companies focused on the smaller networks that we have. I think we've lost the soul of what made Instagram Instagram and your friends and your family. I used to be able to go on and see what my friends were doing and see what my family was doing. I think the, the problem is the incentives are always to go to more commercial, more creators, more deals, more ad dollars. There was this moment, gosh, maybe four years before I left Instagram where we had this emergency meeting talking about creators doing their own ads and like how did we want to be part of that, mm -hmm. that, that ecosystem or not. And, and I, I think basically the feeling was it was going to happen anyway, so push into it. But the problem is that that takes all the content and it makes it commercial. I had friends on very early, some of these people who are famous, and they used to post photos of their daily lives and it was quickly becoming hashtag ad, hashtag ad. Mm -hmm. And that to me feels like not the Instagram that we started. And I'm not someone who tries to hold on to the past. I understand that things evolve, but like, God, like Instagram used to be this place where you could consume what everyone was doing and, and can we get back to that? I believe so. But I also believe that there's this natural selection of, of companies that get too big and and, and too happy with, with the commercial success that eventually they move slowly enough that someone comes up beneath them and starts doing that job yep. again better. Um, I think work. that's actually very healthy. Your path was that, was trying exactly. to, it didn't work. But, but I mean, we talked, you, you mentioned other ideas like the Instagram before Instagram. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Timing is 100% of what made Instagram Instagram. We happened to launch right when the iPhone 4 came out. It was just when people started to take a ton of photos on their phone instead of these enormous you know, point and shoots that they would carry around. Um, timing is 100% what made Instagram Instagram. And yes, there was a lot of execution that involved in making it great. But in general, ideas are a dime a dozen. So the question is just, okay, given the context of where everything lies in social now, is there an opening for people to go after this friends and family content? I've got to imagine there is. Yeah, but let's talk about you. you I'm not going to revisit it. I'm going to. So let's get yeah. what you're doing now because I was I was using I was using I I've sort of gone off Twitter quite a bit, but I was looking at it last night. There's tons of information on this banking thing. Yeah. So much of it bad. Most many VCs screaming. Sorry, you know, we're talking about artifact. Artifact. Using yeah, it on, yeah okay, I'm using yeah. it. Artifact was full of news that actually I trust, yeah. right? But I didn't use it much as a social network. Twitter was hair on fire, toxic waste dump with a lot of good information mixed in, yep, right? Yep, and yep. a lot of bad information. And then it made you feel bad. You really literally felt like you, all the money was gonna go down some sinkhole and you'll never see it again kind of thing. And, and, and disaster was afoot. Um, talk about how you got to that. So you were in, you left in 2018, you became a dad, you have two kids. Um, you, what did you wanna do? Did you have pressure on you to make something else? Because 2018 was a while ago, I have to tell you. 
Tell me how you really chop, feel. Chop, chop. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, I, I don't know if you remember this, but we had breakfast after yes, I left. Yes, we did, I remember. And I remember you saying, like, Street. please don't retire, like, do something again. Yeah. Something, because, uh, and I appreciate that. And that. The reason why I did that is because I'm like, these fucking assholes are running wild. Can you come back, please, as soon as possible? That's why. <laughs> Took a while. Yeah. Um, it's true. It's, it's 100% true. In the transcript, that will be mild applause. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So what happened? Let the record so, show. So you um, had these kids, I get. So I have these kids, and uh, uh, I don't know. I've never met like a musician who had a first hit, um, and I've never talked to them about this. But I've got to imagine that second album is is terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, it's like that. It's it's okay. How could we ever possibly top Instagram? You can't. And the second you let go of that, I, I once saw um, Vince Gilligan talk uh, Breaking Bad. Vince Gilligan. And he said, I took zero time before the ending of Breaking Bad and moving on to Better Call Saul because I didn't want that voice to creep in that said, hey, don't do this. It won't be as good as the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm going to take two years. <laughs> oh, good. And so every, the, the funny thing is every month that went by, it got harder and harder. But there was a moment where I said, you know what? Screw it. Uh, I believe in a few things. One. Uh, I met with the smartest people I knew, Mike, my co-founder, uh, Adam D'Angelo from Quora, who was the first CTO of Facebook, he and he was uh, great for us at Instagram. And both were focused on machine learning. They both said, that's the next wave. And this was 2019, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, all right, I love math. Uh, I'm a dork, so I'm going to go into it. I'm going to study everything I possibly can. COVID hits. So I say, okay, how can I learn about machine learning during COVID? We did RT.live. And it was a dashboard and it uses all sorts of fancy math to predict where COVID is spreading, et cetera. Um, it was okay, but it was enough that it made me think, you know what, this is super fun and machine learning is going the right direction. So what can we do? So I studied it and I said, ah, I believe the right thing to do is uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. This was before it was trendy, to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, and I what- I was trying to date the other Kevin Roos, but go ahead. <laughs> so, I've wait, read the article. Kevin has an article about how the- how the chat GPT wants to do Oh, that. I see, I see. Oh, go ahead. So um, chat GPT, like basically machine learning, and I was like, okay, I think I know a fair amount about social, so, so I drew those two circles in my mind. And then I said, okay, what in the world feels like it is either kryptonite to touch or has a lot going on it that, that everyone talks about the problems and no one talks about the solutions? Mm -hmm. I was like, news. Because I worked at one of these companies, Facebook, and I mean, internally, it was like, do we do something about news? Yes, we're going to do something about news, but what do we do? And the publishers don't like us, and we don't like them. And, and then you see what Twitter is doing about it. You're like, it doesn't feel like anyone's actually attacking this problem in the right way. And if you study the problem, I mean, Totiao in China is phenomenally successful, started by ByteDance. Not many people know this narrative, by the way. Like, uh, uh, TikTok didn't just come out of nowhere. It was Musical.ly, and ByteDance layered their AI on top of Musical.ly. But where did they get their AI? They got it from building Tochiao, which was a news recommender in China that more or less looks like Artifact today. Mm -hmm. um, Except with 100% more news about Tiananmen Square, but go ahead. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, 1% more than 99%. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we, we, basically, I looked at it, I was like, you know what? It feels like someone has to do something about how we consume information because it's, yeah. it, it's, it's dominated by the loudest voices in Silicon Valley or, or on Twitter, and that feels wrong. Like, why should the person with the most followers be the person who delivers COVID news to you? It should not be. Exactly. Yeah. So why is it? But this is the other thing that pains me, okay? For the longest, we just take this for granted that the, the recommender system of the world should be the people we follow on social media. Mm -hmm. No, that was a hack because we couldn't figure any other way out to figure out what content you wanted. So we said, you know what? Uh, it's your friends. Who your, your friends and your family and the people you went to college with, those are the people who are going to mm -hmm. decide what you see and consume every day. That worked okay for a while. And then we decided, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't have to be friends with them. You should just be able to follow them. And then that worked for a little while. And then these things got really big and all of a sudden, all of the information you consume comes from a handful of people who just happen to be best at building an audience. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with the quality of the information or how good it is for you. So I, I looked around and I said, I think machine learning can do this. Let's, uh, the worst thing about social media is that it's social. Mm -hmm. Get rid of all the follow graph. <laughs> 
I'm serious. Yeah. Get rid of the follow graph and, and like, I don't know, I feel like picking on someone in the audience and being like, what makes you you? Are you into, you know, authentic Mexican cooking? Do you really love wakeboarding? I'm, t I'm talking about tech pros now. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you like wakeboarding, don't you? No, I don't. I don't okay. do kite surfing or any of that. Okay, right, um, good. <laughs> but my point is, like, what makes you you? What type of music are you, you into? And it turns out your friends and the people you follow are not necessarily the best people to serve that for you. But imagine there's a service that in real time can crawl the web and find all those things for you and know they're great for you that and was deliver the great to premise you. premise of the web in the first place. Exactly. So the idea we, were, we are working on today is one of the least original ideas in tech. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, news recommender. Okay, great. So what's different? Mm -hmm. One, we can get a lot of attention, a lot of people in, so that the data can then come back in spades. It allows it, the system to work because machine learning requires a lot of data. And machine learning changed fundamentally in the last five years, but really in the last year, to the point where you can be talking to a chatbot, which by the way, is also one of the least original ideas in technology, mm -hmm. but then something clicks and you go, oh my God, this thing is, is it sentient? Mm -hmm. Now I don't have a job at Google. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, like, <laughs> mild laughter. Yeah, um, it's the guy who thought, <laughs> another, another tech pro who thought he was dating yeah, the bot. But that's ahead. right. So my point is, um, Sometimes the best ideas, even like an image-based social network, not necessarily the most rocket science of the world, but with the right team and the right timing and the right execution, you could do big things. And I think it is enormously important for us to get ahead of information consumption because it is part of why we are all getting pulled apart. Mm -hmm. So will we solve this? I have no idea. I'm not gonna be that tech bro that right. so, surfs so and announces we're gonna solve it. But. It, it, it. So you're building artifact with knowledge of how er, social media has fucked up, right? That's part of the part of it. Part of it is machine learning. That's right. And the idea that there is good, there could be good coming out of it, that it starts to define you in good ways and not in the, in which I always talk about is engagement equals enragement. Right. Or enragement equals engagement. Kind Can I tell of. you about one of the most exciting ideas I've learned about as studying this? Sure. This thing called bridging algorithms. And I don't know how many of you guys have seen this, but. The idea is that at scale, you can basically cluster your users into viewpoints. You kind of know, is someone far right? Is someone far left? Are they moderate? And what you do is you look for content that basically uh, it resonates with all groups, not just one group. It looks for non-polarizing. Commonalities. That's right. And you know, I have other issues around a, a service just showing things that bring people together because I think that's boring and down down the fairway. But in general, as a signal, it's pretty you, much now just Dolly Parton. But go ahead, go ahead <laughs> for this country. You, you can find topics, not topics within a topic. You can find sources and articles that bring people together rather than push them apart. Right. Quantitatively. And I think that's really exciting. Now, has it been proving it out at scale? I don't think so. There are a lot of nice papers on it. But you've got, you've got academics, you've got these thinkers thinking about the problems that, that social media has today. And there are ways of trying to solve this. And I'm just excited to be in the middle of that and have a platform that might be able to use these things. Is, is saving journalism one of your goals? I mean, I, you know, Andrew Mason talked to me about an interest he had in that. And now he's gone on to do an audio podcast thing. But was that of interest or you just wanted people to get better information and not tear each other apart? I don't believe, I, I'm not, I can't say in all, I can't sit up here and say I'm here to save journalism. Yeah, I like, yeah. no, I, well, first of all, I won't because I think a lot of journalism is thriving. Do, do all industries have existential crises in certain way at, at all times? Yes. But do I look at journalism and say, there's a lot of great stuff going on. Can we push on that? So for instance, independent publishing, like the fact that anyone can start a Substack now and gain a, a fairly large audience and be like, I, I was talking to someone who started one before this called Big Technology and like he's got a, a large audience and people are paying attention to him and he's on Substack, he's an independent journalist. Anyone should be able to be a journalist if they want to. They shouldn't have to necessarily join one of the large publishers that exist. Mm -hmm. In some ways, you are this. You, yes, we right? did. We just had a glommet together ourselves. In fact, I made a deal with uh, Matt Mullenweg for what we talked to Six Apart. Remember them? Of course. Just, you had to glom it together, and there was no video then. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we used, what's that terrible video service for many years? I hated him. I'd call him all the time. Anyway, there was no video. There was a lot. We had to literally sort of make our own thing right there. we did try that's exactly my what we point were doing. is just that the ecosystem now exists to be able to do this on your own and yeah. I believe that long term 
Um, it is not my job to save journalism, but it is, in fact, my job to spot the opportunities and lean into them. So Casey Newton called uh, uh, Artifact a TikTok for text. How do you describe it? It's got a nice alliteration to it. Yeah, but I don't like TikTok for anything, like yeah. or Facebook of, that kind of thing. How would you It's an it? easy way to describe it so that people can grok it. Um, usually the experience, I think, on Artifact is you open it up and you use it for, I don't know, a few hours the first you know, couple days, and you say, like, I don't really get it. What's different? But then someone, like people will call me a week into it and go, oh, I see, like it's clicking. You go through kind of this J curve. Um, and our job is just to shorten that J curve to the point where you can use it and within a day you're getting exactly what you'd like. But what's fascinating to me is how many people feel that traditional sources, whether it's Twitter or otherwise, don't serve their interests. Mm -hmm. Tons of people love F1, but it's hard to get all of F1 in one place. Mm -hmm. It's hard to follow just your specific driver or right, whatever. Right, right. And that to me feels like such an easy opportunity to take advantage of, and, and Artifact does that. Well, in many ways, I, the way I was describing to someone I think last night was Twitter is like a library with all the books on the floor and then it's covered with toxic waste. <laughs> so there's some good stuff in there, but Watch. Last night I was I was like okay. No, the I'm, burns I'm, I'm, are very bad when you. Touch I'm on stage with Kara, and we I gotta make this spicy. But you right. just did. Right. Okay. But, Library with okay. books. Well, there. it is. Like, I hope you don't become that. But people have called you a Twitter competitor. How much uh, does that drive you? How much does the chaos there benefit you? Zero percent planned, um, and it's unclear if the chaos will be positive chaos for Twitter or negative chaos in the long run. Meaning what? Meaning sometimes chaos breeds creativity and new products and new ways of thinking. And, and I think you would agree for the longest time that Twitter stayed very much the same as a product. They did, it's, yes. Um, I don't agree with all the changes happening. Would I do it the same way? No, but maybe that's part of why tech is so exciting right now because mm -hmm. it's not exciting if you're on the receiving end of a layoff notice from Twitter, obviously, as an employee. but. As someone I don't watching, even think they tell them, they just... No, they there's, just, there's no notice. Like, but on the outside, yeah. you've got to imagine maybe great stuff can come from all of this chaos. Um, in terms of being a competitor, sure, in terms of news, but uh, like I kind of find that uninteresting because uh, we're just doing what we're doing. It's and not I, even close to the same. It's not I don't think so. But is, do you, do you, because you have social media on there, and I don't use your social media part at all. Well, we I, do. We've unlocked it for you, but not for everyone. Oh, okay. There yeah. is a social media part, yeah. but I don't use it at all. That's okay. So it doesn't matter. We're very um, small. There's yeah. no audience yet. Yeah, but I use the news reading. I, how do you glom those? To, what do you think it is? Because is it a social media network for news, or is it a newsreader that has social media on it? I think it's the latter, but I have this thesis that um, uh, all great social networks start as utilities. You have a great utility, uh, whether it's a filter app or a directory at a college. The only counterexample, and you have to help me with this, is Twitter. I can't quite get my head around what the utility of Twitter was before it was a social network. But generally speaking, you found a utility first. And then once it grows, you can figure out the ways of adding social. And we launched with a very specific view that if we were going to be massive someday, we'd have to be extremely useful for a specific job that people have in their lives, which is to consume information that matters to them. Yeah. And only Trusting then do we get like a coupon that allows us to start doing social stuff. Yeah, I think it's trusted information. I think, I, I, I literally spent last night, I'm like, and what stock do you own? And what, why are you saying this? And why are you, it's, it's exhausting. And I went right off of it again, because I can't, I don't understand, I don't know who's a liar. I have an idea of some people, but. But I, I, but, I, but, I also can't, like, I don't know, I look at this audience and I think, like, how many people are using Twitter more than they did pre-Elon? I see literally a single hand. Yep, I'm not. That's actually stark. Right. Um, interesting. It makes you feel bad. I was, Worse. literally, I was about to go into how I think that good ideas are really hard to kill. Yeah. And that I, like, I would not bet against the momentum that good ideas have. I would agree. It should, it should do well. I just think I could use 100% less misogyny, racism, and uh, homophobia. But that's me. Um, so um, talk about... Um, the publishers that are your own platform, you leave out, who you leave out as important as who you leave in. You have Fox News, but not Newsmax, The Daily Wire, but not Daily Caller. How did you make these decisions? And what is your relationship with these media companies? Because they've been burned a zillion times. Yeah. It won't surprise you to know that I, I like when we were making this decision, I said to myself, we're gonna be asked. Um, so first of all, we don't think of ourselves as cable where we like carry or don't carry. 
Um, I just think that it is irresponsible to build a recommender system, which by the way, you can't really look into a recommender system. If you do, they're just a bunch of numbers and boxes. Mm -hmm. You, don't, you can't interpret exactly why it's doing what it's doing. You can try, but you can't. So if you're going to go so far as to feed information into these systems and let it loose, you gotta make sure that the stuff you're putting in is responsible. Mm -hmm. So I think of it more as like, what are we going out of our way to put into the recommendation system right. uh, proactively? So what I said internally, I was like, all right, we gotta have, we gotta have our principles. And what we decided was our goal is to have a ba balanced ideology subject to integrity and quality. Quality being not just a ton of ads and spam and pop-up videos. Integrity being you generally adhere to like well-accepted principles of journalism mm -hmm. and balanced ideology in that we're not just carrying one side or the other. We're trying to find as many sources across the spectrum. Right. And that's a lot harder to do than you think. But you use third-party sites. There's, you know, allsides.com is one of them. There are a bunch of these services which literally rate right. different sources. And you sources. can make choices. This yeah. is the thing that tech people don't get. You can actually make editorial choices and it's that's okay. That's right. So we um, did. Do you have to change because of the recent revelations about uh, Fox News saying one thing and doing another? Um, I need to look, but I believe we don't carry, when, when you say we carry all of Fox or Just we carry all, part. I, I believe we carry very specific parts of these different organizations yep. because obviously News Corp is very large, right. New York Times is very large, they own The Athletic, etc. So what we do is we don't just say it's a one or, one or nothing, we generally look at all of the independent properties because generally sure. they're run very differently. Who, who didn't make the cut? Who else didn't make the cut? I mean, we'd have to look, a lot of people. What was one that you were like, uh-uh? Uh, currently, we don't carry Team Z, mm -hmm. um, not because we're against them, but because there have been a bunch of issues around how they have acquired information for their stories in the past, and it feels like, on balance, not the appropriate thing to do at this time. Wow, ethics, that's fantastic. Um, content moderation, you've said you're going to remove posts that contain falsehoods. Whoa, hard. How do you do that cost-effective at scale, as you are well aware of these problems? And how, how have you handled, um, how are you going to handle some of, say, a VC is calling for a run on the bank, for example, recently that just happened. Um, how do you deal with that? Because it's a massive issue and Facebook spent a lot of money on this. There seems to be no solution. The flood is so big. How do you deal with the content moderation? Is it going to be through machine learning? Is it going to be, how do you do that? So the problem, I think one of the problems with content moderation on something like Facebook or Twitter is when you're taking it down, you're taking down your post. Mm -hmm. And although there's no guarantee of free speech outside of government. You can't just like, I think these, these platforms think of people posting a, as the lifeblood of the system. Mm -hmm. When you are simply distributing content, it feels a lot easier to say, you know what, that article doesn't, that article violates these principles and therefore we're not gonna let it be distributed. Mm -hmm. That feels like an easy decision because it's between two res responsible parties. It's a publisher and it's a, you can make, and it's a company. You, you can call make, yourself a publisher? I don't think so, because we don't create any original content. Right, so you're a platager. I, I like, wh sorry, what's Platform that? Platform publisher. Oh, okay. It's my word. Um, <laughs> uh, platager, I'll use that, I guess. Um, it's been around. No, no, we, uh, the way I think about it, like we are a glorified dating machine. We mm -hmm. find people who are interested in things and we make connections I see. where there wouldn't glorified have been connections. Machine. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. But you talk about, um, another word I have is reporterpreneur, but I hate that. Um, uh, it's a reporter who does entrepreneurial stuff. I understand. Stuff. Yeah, I got it. Okay. It's not, it, it hasn't caught on. It hasn't caught on and it shouldn't. It's a terrible word. Um, talk about then using AI for artifact because Instagram rode the iPhone wave. You, you know, this is what major and many companies like yours. Um, Uber, others, many others. And now Artifact wants to ride the AI or machine learning wave. Um, why will that make Artifact better than, say, Apple News? You've previously said machine learning is like a dark art and doesn't work until it works. Yeah. Um, why, why will that make the difference here? And that's the key part of this, correct? So when you start this stuff, you have to figure out where you figure out in the ecosystem. And Apple News is actually a very good product for, for the head if you want headlines and if you want kind of the major publishers. But I think what we've leaned into is when I say the long tail, I mean it's okay to put a sub stack on. It's okay to find a lot of these like independent publishers of mm -hmm. recipes or, or what have you. And F1 or these niche interests that maybe aren't big enough for these lar larger pro mm -hmm. products. And the bet is 
that the sum of all these niche interests is actually far greater than the need for yet another, you know, headline. Like Apple News is great, so why would I need another place to consume my headlines? Mm -hmm. I don't. I have the New York Times, I have Apple News, I have literally, you can go out and find any number of services that, to do that, but if you're super interested in specific topics, mm -hmm. Artifact can be that place where it knows you. Like the gaming industry is super interesting. We, we collect all these amazing blogs on gaming and we have the headlines every single day in the gaming industry and that might just not be interesting enough for some of these larger projects. So, right. so, products, so the bet is the long tail is super interesting. Specificity. So you've also talked about Artifact generating individually AI articles in the future. I think we have, there's a lot so of So we news could be a publisher of Yes, you could be. Um, there's already a lot of news aggregators, not enough news reporters. What happens to news gathering is an AI is cribbing the few remaining reporters? Um, well, if you want to describe it as cribbing, okay. then like, um, I think the articles that will get written by AI are more synthesis articles that point you to deeper articles. So if you want to understand the totality of the SVB crisis, mm -hmm. no one generally writes the meta piece on what art articles to go read to get the full picture. Mm -hmm. We can show you a list, but we don't write the full article. All I'm saying when we say we might write articles someday, I can imagine showing up and saying, hey, you wanna learn about the SVB crisis? Here's the background of how it started. Here's a great piece by so-and-so yeah. on the fallout. Here's government intervention, and it breaks it up into these clusters so that you can see all sides of it. That's the kind of article that I think- Planer at Vox Media did that. That was by, by hand, though. By yeah, but I think things that will be automated will be automated, and investigative journalism will never be written by ChatGPT generally because it can't go do that investigation yet. Right, yet. Although uh, they, OpenAI tends to surprise us. Yes, it does. So that's another thing, uh, misinformation at scale. I mean, some of this stuff is kind of silliness, the, the, some of the articles. I think the media has not done the best job of covering what's going on here. But there is, a, I, I just was talking to Tristan Harris. He's got a very frightening- Classmate of mine at Stanford, yeah. Um, he thinks people are running into it too fast in another sloppy way. Are you worried about misinformation at scale? Of course. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why we have to make decisions about what the recommendation engine puts out in the world is exactly that. Mm -hmm. I, it's like, if you take something untrue and you put it out in the world with perfect matching to people who are susceptible to believing that thing, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. And obviously one of the existential issues of our industry. So we think a lot about it. And it's part of why we care deeply about what we put into the system. What you put in there. So that's yeah. why you're making the choices. The other one is addictiveness to make platforms work. You know all about that. Right. Um, it also makes them dangerous. Um, and of course, much has been written about this. Um, how do you plan to mitigate that? Or is that not something that people like what they like and they want to read about it all the time? Like I could read as much as possible about Jared Butler, I happen to like him. Um, I love all his movies. White House is down, whatever. I don't yeah. care what he does. He's in a plane. I was watching his new movie, Plane, on a plane. It was about a plane crash. And the, the steward was like, really? And I go, uh-huh, it's Jared Butler. So I, I'm just saying, is that how you do it? I don't mind being addicted to things I'm addicted to. Uh, in this particular case, if people read more and consumed more quality information, I think the world might be a better place. Mm -hmm. So. In a world that people are using our product more, I think that's a good thing. Now, uh, we'll get, I would love to be at the place where I'm discussing people reading too much. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. Okay, all right, I just have a few more questions. I'm gonna go over But one. if you're a VC, it's going great. <laughs> it's going great. All right, that's, my last few questions are this. New, news is not an easy business. You know, media is hard. I remember when Andreessen Hartz, is, someone there called me after they put a future and they're like, we're gonna kick your ass. I'm like, <laughs> it's a shitty business and you suck. Um, so. Congratulations. Is that what you're saying to me? Or? No, 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 no. You're not making stuff. Advertising subscriptions revenue are ways to monetize. Instagram sells ads. Twitter is trying to make a subscription service, but it keeps breaking the, the system. Uh, Post, which I'm advising sometimes, is uh, focus on revenue share. Which, how are you going to make money at this? I get asked by every publisher, yes, every investor, yeah. sure. um, and it's the answer question. is I have no idea. Okay. It's all on the table. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we are having a, a, a phenomenal metamorphosis from just ad-driven to, yeah, I'm willing to pay for something quality. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you've got people who used to pay for Netflix and now the ad-supported model is coming. So it's really unclear what direction we're headed and for what content. I also just, I, I'm not, 
uh, I'm not a fortune teller, so I don't know what will resonate with people the most. So you don't know. Um, I don't know. So I have to get that money back from SVB. Yes, yeah, yeah, clearly. <laughs> but you self-funded it. Um, it, 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 it. Should you have gotten VC funding? Would you have, or you just want to talk to them? I just don't think we're there yet. Yeah. Um, I'd, rather, uh, I'd rather not have any, any pressure from an outside firm to move on things that we don't need to be moving on yet. Um, and that sounds like kind of a can't answer because it is, but like, I don't know. I, I was talking to someone recently and they were like, do you know why like Bill Gates has done so well? And I was like, no. And they're like, have you ever heard of any VCs that invest in Microsoft? And I was like, not really. And they're like, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's an extreme, but um, I think that owning your own destiny, actually, let me tell a good Elon story. Okay, all right. Oh. So I've only met him in person once and we were having lunch and, um, we were talking about other stuff, but I said, oh, do you do angel investing? I'm like kind of dabbling in angel investing, thinking that would impress him. It didn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, and he, he goes, why the fuck would I do that? Oh. And I was like choked on some asparagus. And, um, and I was like, well, I don't know. You know a lot of people and they really respect you. And he goes, I invest in myself. And I that thought about it story. as a contrarian view, but I was like, I get it. Like if you're gonna spend all this time and it's hard and it can be miserable at times and it doesn't work until it works, right. um, you might as well invest in yourself. And I, I so do point. I feel- And then he vomited on you and shot himself in the foot, but go ahead. No, no I'm teasing. That's an excellent point. I would agree. That's the best of Elon. But he- um, That's about it, but go ahead, right now. My reflection of it, from it was if you are lucky enough to be in a position to be able to invest in yourself. That is the greatest freedom in the world because you can do great things and you can be independent. And I think you look at two structures, one in which Facebook, Mark has been able to control the board forever and, and, and build towards the destiny he believes Facebook should build. Or you could be caught in fights over the boardroom at Twitter, fights over the CEO job, who owns what. I'd rather be in the position where, where there's this phrase that we use a lot, we may not be right, but we're not confused. And part of why I want to invest in myself and in our team is because I, I, I feel like there, the chances of being confused are very high in this world. So we need to have a particular point of view and work very hard on it to, to keep that path. All right. But that's not to say that, that the investment won't come because I think there are some great investors out there. I don't think you need it necessarily, but let's, Let's talk about that. Assume you'll grow, maybe go to an IPO if the price was right. Would you ever sell again if it was successful? Um, what's what's a one percent below one percent? <laughs> no. So not to Mark, not to Elon, not to TikTok. I think freedom is the greatest thing in the world, and being able to manifest your own destiny and and make amazing uh, things. Hey. I, um, so uh, I think uh, the chances are really, really low on that. Really low. So my last question, in 2020, you were being considered for TikTok CEO. Remember I called you about that? Um, I don't actually remember that. Oh, but I did. Um, so did, maybe I texted you. Did you dodge a bullet there? What would you do if you were TikTok CEO? It seems like a Besides great a job. in Congress, yeah, right. It seems like a great job. I don't know. It's like one of the world's most transformative products and companies and if you, it's, it's, you know, it's like a car. If you drive it in the wrong way, you can hurt a lot of people. And if you drive in the right way, I guess you're driving a car. Um, <laughs> I don't know where that was going. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Should the government Sometimes I say smart things. I'm like, I know, what, the, but what the, was that? You know what that was? <laughs> That seems smarter than it was, actually. Okay, which okay. Which is a successful thing. Which is a successful thing. I appreciate so, that. Um, I got out of the question, by the way. Okay, good. Yeah. I, uh, I'd like to know, what would you do? Yeah, see, should that it was be not banned? smart. Should it be, um, I'll give you another one. Should they, you can either have that one or should the government ban TikTok? I do believe that uh, TikTok is so powerful and it is so popular in the United States. And just like if Artifact were that, pop, that powerful to distribute information, you have to ask yourself, like, if it is not run inside of the United States, and it's run by a competitor. Yeah. Uh, when I say run by a competitor, run in a competitive state. Like, what do you do? Like, are, are you okay with that? The Chinese have always said, no, it's why you can't have Instagram here. It's why you can't have Facebook here. So I don't think it's, it's crazy to say that, that we should look at it really closely. Yeah, which is not an answer. I don't think we should ban it. Yeah. 
but I think we should figure out how to run it in an independent way inside of the United States. I think that's a really smart plan. Now, whether or not that is tractable, it's why, why that job is really hard and why I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, last question for entrepreneurs here. Yeah. I, I always, what's your advice right now in this very fraught environment, I would say? Um, stay out of the hype. No one's ever won because they bought into the hype. No one's, ever, no, no one's ever done great things because they went the way everyone else is going. Uh, I think being contrarian and finding spots that, that people, f being a contrarian and finding opportunities in places that people have either written off or ignored is like a thing we did with Instagram that I hope to do again. But um, there's that and uh, I get how hard it is. I'm in it the second time and of course like it's slightly easier this time, but uh, it feels to me just as hard as the first time, so just keep going. That's what I'd say. Kevin Systrom, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.